Hi. Okay, uh, it's the end of the chemistry unit. So um, for science o'clock today, we're going to review uh, group one, group seven, and group three. Um, we uh, have seen most of these things, so it's just going over. Well, I'll do the reactivity series next lesson, uh, some questions, maybe even a test. Um, so, uh, but let's start off. Uh, see, this pen's working this time. It is how many electrons can you fit? So this is just a general one. Uh, how many electrons can you fit on the inner shell of an atom? So you've got atom, nucleus. How many electrons can you fit on the inner shell? How many electrons can you fit in the second shell? How many can you? Not like, well, it's different for every element, but how many can you? How many ele electrons do group one have in their outer shell? How many electrons do group seven have in their outer shell? And how many would group eight or zero have? Okay, pause. Write down the answers. Come back when you're done. Okay, right, so how many electrons can you fit on the inner shell? The answer is two. How many electrons can you fit on the next shell? The answer is eight. How many electrons do group one elements have in their outer shell? They have just one. How many electrons do group seven have? Do you see the pattern? They have seven. How many would group zero or group eight have? It's not a trick question. Uh, the first one, helium, just has two, but all the others have eight. That is supposed to be an eight. Eight. There we go. So that many electrons on the outer shell are these. And that's a good starting place, uh, looking at the outer shell, because that's what makes all of these elements the way they are. OK, so let's just review group one. Some of the properties of group one. If we remember what the word soft meant, or maybe it's easier to remember what the hard meant. Hard means you can't very easily damage something or scratch it. So if something is soft, uh, it's the opposite. You can easily damage it or cut, us or cut it. So if you take a group one metal and you cut it with a knife, it will slice like a piece of butter, um, depending on where it is in the periodic table, how hot or cold the butter is. They have a low density. We know that the first three float on water. They have to have a lower density in water to be able to float. They have low melting and boiling points. Uh, if you look at cesium on a video on the internet, you notice that it melts just by being in the glare of a, of a bulb. So it melts. Um, they are good conductors of heat and electricity. Why? They're metals still. They are still metals. And uh, they're shiny. So this is an example of a freshly cut alkali metal. And you cut it and it's lovely and shiny. Um, but something happens to it when it's left in the air. What happens? It tarnishes, well done. It tarnishes, stops being quite as shiny as it was. I think it was for a second. Okay, so uh, soft, low density, low melting and low boiling points, good conductors of heat and electricity, and shiny, but only when freshly cut. When they're cut, they're shiny, and then over time, they start to tarnish, which means they react with the air, they get kind of coating on the outside. Uh, we know they're in group one, so they must have one electron in their outer shell. If they've got one electron in their outer shell, uh, all of them are in group one, so they all have one electron in their outer shell. They all behave in the same way, because it's that outer shell, that outer electron, and what it does that guides what the reactivity of the element is. So all of them have one electron in their shell. They all react in the same way, but... Look what happens. Look at them as you go down the group. How would you describe the difference from lithium to sodium to potassium? The main difference is, as you go down the group, they get bigger. As you do go down the group, they get bigger. And so that one electron, as it goes down the group, further away from that nucleus. What's the charge of a nucleus? Positive. What's the charge of an electron? Negative. And so that negative electron and that positive nucleus are here in lithium closely attracted. So it's very hard for the lithium to let go. It's harder for the lithium to let go of that electron because they're so closely bound. We go down to potassium. Those two are quite far away. So it's much easier for potassium to give up that electron due to that distance between them. And so that's why lithium is not as reactive as sodium, and sodium is not as reactive as potassium. And that's because 
Lithium is smaller than sodium, and sodium is smaller than potassium. So lithium is less reactive because that electron is closer to the nucleus and so more attracted, so it's harder to get away. Sodium is bigger, the electron isn't as attracted to the nucleus as it is in lithium because it itself uh, is um, bigger than lithium. So it's easier for that electron to get away from the attraction. And potassium is bigger still, that electron's even further away. And because the electron's even further away, it's much easier for that electron to escape. And so therefore react. So we go large, the atoms of each element get larger going down the group. This means the outer shell electron gets further away from a nucleus and is shielded more by the electrons. The further an electron is from the positive nucleus, the easier it can be lost in a reaction. And this is why the reactivity of the group one metals increase as you go down the group. And questions. So here we go. First few questions. Uh, just when you're in your book, write down the answers. Don't write the question. Explain the trend in terms of electronic structure the group one elements. So basically, can you describe how the group one elements electrons are arranged? Then you'll need your periodic table, it's in your planner. Find out where rubidium is. From your knowledge and appearances, lithium, sodium and potassium, can you make a prediction about rubidium? And what would you observe if you were able to put rubidium with water? And then can you write a word equation and a balanced similar equation for the reaction of rubidium with oxygen and water. Pause, do that, come back when you're done. Go. We done that? Okay, explain the trend in terms of electronic structures as the group one elements. So they all have one. So one electron in outer shell. Uh, but as you go down the table, they get more Find out where rubidium is on the periodic table at the bottom. It's at the bottom of group one. From your knowledge and appearance of sodium, lithium, sodium and potassium, make a prediction about rubidium, its appearance. I'm going to say shiny. Shiny when cut, but quickly tarnishes. So you cut it, it looks very silver, quickly tarnishes. There's a very good chance it would back to be a liquid. What would you reserve when it reacts with metal? It will fizz, give off a gas. Uh, it will probably catch fire. And there's a very good chance it will explode. It will also um, turn water alkaline it will fizz and it will catch on fire it will explode and it will turn the water alkaline write a word equation and a balanced simple equation for the reaction of rubidium with oxygen i'm just going to be lazy rubidium plus o2 goes to uh and how many of these? That's minus one. And so two of them, two of them, two, that's four. Shocking. Um, yeah, there we go. And with water, I'll leave that for you. Okay, now we're on to the halogens. So we did those a uh, few lessons ago. Uh, 
All of these are generally unpleasant. Uh, chlorine, pale green gas, smelly and poisonous. Uh, it appears as chlorides normally, uh, especially in sodium chloride in the sea. It melts at 101, minus 101 degrees, and it boils at minus 35 degrees. Bromine is a deep red liquid with brown, red brown vapor. It is also smelly and poisonous. It occurs as bromides, uh, specifically magnesium bromide in the sea. It melts at minus seven and it boils at 59 degrees. Iodine is a gray solid with a purple vapor. It is smelly and harmful. It occurs as iodized and sometimes in rocks and seaweeds. It melts at 114 and it boils at 118. Uh, they're all very reactive. We know they're reactive. It's like the uh, group one, which is their electron structure, and they've all got the same electron structure. So they're very reactive, but they're non-metals. They're on the other side of the periodic table. They're all toxic or harmful. And like the alkali metals, you never find them free in nature because of how reactive they are. If you, if they were left outside, they would automatically react. So they would always form a compound. So you won't ever find them. Uh, they'll form a salt compound uh, with a metal normally. The word hell do you need salt former? And like the group one, um, they all have the same electron arrangement as in full inner shell. And then when you get to the outer shell, there's always one electron missing, as in it's not complete. So there's seven electrons in their outer shell. Fluorine has two on the inner, seven on the outer. Chlorine has two on the inner, then eight on the next, and then seven on the outer. Bromine has two on the inner, then eight, then eight, and then seven on the outer. Uh, they all have similar chemical properties because they have the same number of electrons in the outer shell. And uh, their reactivity is opposite. Remember, these ones want to get an electron to have a complete outer shell. Which one is most likely? It's that fluorine. That fluorine has a positive nucleus. And then the electron comes in and that electron can get really close to that positive nucleus because it only has a few shells, two shells. So it's much easier for fluorine to attract an electron than chlorine. Chlorine also has a positive nucleus, but that outer shell is further away, so it's less attractive. Bromine, positive nucleus, but that outer shell even further away, so it's much less likely to attract an electron in. So that's why fluorine is the most attractive uh, and therefore reactive, because it can attract the electron on very easy, having a chemical reaction. Chlorine, still quite reactive, but not as reactive as fluorine because it's bigger, so it's harder to attract the electron in. And bromine, bigger still, so less reactive. Just to review, they're all non-metals. They're all on that side of the table. They don't conduct electricity. Um, you wouldn't want to try and conduct electricity with them because they smell and that would just make them hard, even more deadly. If they were solid, they'd be crumbly and brittle and they're poisonous and smelly. Uh, and they get darker as you go down the group. Chlorine is yellow, chlorine is green, bromine is red, and iodine is blue-black. Oh, some uses. Didn't do this before. Fluorine. Fluorine is used in non-stick frying pans. How handy. It's processing uranium nuclear fuel. Two quite different things. And it's actually in your toothpaste. Uh, fluoride, because it's obviously as a compound. Oop, where's the thing? There's oh, it's gone. Chlorine. It's used in pesticides and weed killers. It's also a most a very common antiseptic in disinfect and disinfectant. It has been added to drinking water in Britain since 1897. It's before I was born. Bleach, uh, it kills bacteria. It can make paper white and it removes ink from recycled paper. And it can also be used to make some plastics. Uh, bromine is used as an insecticide, kills insects. Uh, it's used in some fire extinguishers. When you want to put a fire out without adding water, like computer-based fires, electric base, you put water on it, it would damage everything. Uh, it's used in the pharmaceutical industry and in some uh, soft drinks, mm. obviously in small amounts. And iodine. Um, uh, you can use iodine to make an image on a piece of paper, photographic paper, inks and dyes, again antiseptics and disinfectants in animal feed and in types of light bulbs. Hmm. Here's a little quiz, perfect for you to do. I'll upload this to the VLE so you can have a go with this one yourself. But another question. Uh, now I want you to find astatine on the periodic table. 
can you predict the physical state of acetine at room temperature? How will it be? What's the formula of acetine? Can you write a word uh, and symbol equation to show how iodine reacts with potassium acetide? And would you expect acetine to react with potassium chloride? Explain your answers. So uh, I'll give you a minute. Write the answers down. Pause. Do it. Done? Excellent. Physical state acetine at room temperature. So fluorine's a gas, uh, chlorine's a gas, uh, bromine's a liquid, iodine's a solid. And so as we're going down, they're getting more and more, um, their boiling point's increasing. So this one has to be a solid. What's the molecular formula of acetine? Hopefully you all remember that they all appear as diatomic molecules. So AT2. AT2, not the number 82. Write a word equation and a balanced symbol equation for, to show how iodine reacts with potassium acetide. I'm just going to be lazy. I2 plus KAT. And then uh, iodine is more reactive than acetine. So we end up with KIAT2. And then we need to balance it. So we've got two there. So we need a two there and a two there. Is that two? Two potassium, two potassium, acetine, two, acetine, two, iodine, two, iodine, two. Check. So what would you expect if you put acetine with potassium chloride? What happens? Which one's more reactive? Chlorine. So what happens if you put a less reactive with a more reactive compound? Nothing. Nothing happens. Explain your answer, because the more reactive one is already in the compound. Okay, let's do the noble gases part. Uh, all noble gases have full electron shells, so do not need to gain, lose, or share electrons. Helium, neon, and argon. They are full, they are complete, and they are happy. This means they're stable. They don't react. They don't normally form bonds. And they're monatomic, which means they only really ever exist as themselves. They don't need to group with anyone else. So uh, uh, they just is, they are HT. You're not HE2. You have O2 and N2 and I2 and Br2 and Cl2. They're diatomic molecules. The noble gases are just HE. Uh, any, they are. They don't need anyone else. They're fine. Uh, why is it they're called group zero, not group eight? even though it comes after seven, good maps. Um, it used to be called great, sometimes it is, but it's just because helium doesn't have two in its outer shell. So that's kind of like a trick. So um, they're called group eight because they're full, but they're called group zero because they're full, but some period they will still call them group eight. Um, so another quiz for you to do, true or false, one to six, all noble gases have eight electrons in their outer shell. True or false? The properties of noble gases make them difficult to discover. Oh, that was going back to the other lesson. Noble gases are often used in lighting. They're few uses because they're so unreactive and they are monotonic. And the last one, I'm not going to give you the answer to this. Uh, if you think, I can maybe put a little video up showing you the answers next time. Describe the trend in boiling points as you go down the group. Explain this trend in the terms of the attractive forces between particles. Describe the trend in density going down the group. The density of air is 1.2 grams per decimeter cubed. What noble gases would float and what ones sink? Explain. And then explain the trend in densities in terms of relative masses. These are quite similar to the other lesson. So you can do this. I believe in you. Okay. Love you. Bye.